Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to his disciples, a rich man had a steward who was reported to him for squandering his property. He summoned him and said, what is this I hear about you? Prepare a full account of your stewardship because you can no longer be my steward. The steward said to himself, What shall I do now that the master is taking the position of steward away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do so that when I am removed from the stewardship, they may welcome me into their homes. He called in his master's debtors one by one. To the first he said, How much do you owe my master? He replied, One hundred measures of olive oil. He said to him, here is your promissory note. Sit down and quickly write one for 50. Then to another the steward said, and you, how much do you owe? He replied, 100 cores of wheat. The steward said to him, here's your promissory note. Write one for 80. And the master commended that dishonored steward for acting prudently. For the children of this world are more prudent in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. I tell you, make friends for yourselves with dishonest wealth, so that when it fails, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. The person who is trustworthy in very small matters is also trustworthy in great ones. And the person who is dishonest in very small matters is also dishonest in great ones. If therefore you are not trustworthy with dishonest wealth, who will you trust with true wealth? If you are not trustworthy with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours? No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. The Gospel of the Lord. So today's gospel is kind of strange because it seemed, if you heard it correctly, that Jesus is saying that the dishonest steward acted wisely. Well, how can, how can that be? How can someone who acts dishonestly be considered and commended by Jesus? Well, scholars have looked at this passage and debated over it and twisted themselves all up in pretzels and knots trying to figure out how this could be. But I think the church gives us a kind of a clue. In our first reading from the prophet Amos, he talks about how wealth is accumulated in the ancient times, in the Near East, in the Palestine, in Israel, during those times. And essentially, the only way to get wealthy in the time of Jesus and the time of the prophets is to be corrupt. So anyone who was wealthy was automatically corrupt. No one could honestly be wealthy. There were the poor, and the rich who were corrupt, and the poor were the people who were hardworking and honest. And so this kind of changes our story just a little bit because we always focus, it seems, on the dishonored steward and the master. But really, Jesus would be focusing on the poor. That's who he's looking at. Who benefits the most in this story? It's the poor, the person who has their debt written down, is the one who receives the most in this story. And so the focus is on them, not on the steward necessarily. But Luke is trying to understand why this story seems to be, why this parable focuses on the dishonest steward. But I think for us, it's meant to be focused on the poor, how we treat those who are less fortunate. And our duty is to treat them with respect and kindness and reach out and help them. Now, in the United States of America today, we can have wealth with honesty. It's called the middle class. There's plenty of us. All of us here are middle class Americans, and we have all most likely earned our wealth and our savings in honest, hard work. But in the time of Jesus, that wasn't possible. 
So Jesus isn't condemning wealth. He isn't saying that people who have money are bad people. What he's saying is, how are you using it? What are you doing with that wealth? And so he commends this steward because he used his position to do good. And God, as we know, can take things that are bad and make good things come from them. And I think a, a perfect example for me of that is just a little while ago, just a couple days ago, we celebrated, we honored and remembered the September 11th attacks of 2001 in New York City, Washington, and Pennsylvania. And we could have focused on the horrible actions that certain individuals took, but we also remembered the heroic men and women who rushed into danger, who sacrificed themselves, ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And so from those horrible events, we can look and see the good in people. People rallied around in New York, whom everybody thought in New York that if you don't get out of their way, they'll run you over. But on those days, in those days, those people acted with honor and respect. And they worked hard to join together as one. And we became one. We were united in a way that we had uniquely never been united before. So out of that evil event, God was able to show us that we can respond and be good people. And that's what Jesus is saying today about the dishonest steward. Yes, he was a bad person and did dishonest things, but from that dishonesty, God was able to work something good. So when something is difficult in our lives and we're wondering, where is God in this moment? Where is God in our lives? He's right there with you, doing the best for you. Can you be open to taking the difficulties of your life and saying, you know, Lord, help me to see this and do something good from it. Something good can come from the struggles that I am facing. Each one of us will struggle and have difficulties. Can we look at that and find the positive and ask God to help us to find that positive in our lives where we can make something good come from what is bad in our lives? That's the message that Jesus wants to deliver to us, that God wants to deliver to us, that he is always there with us. You know, um, some people today preach a gospel I'd like to call, they call it the gospel of health and wealth. This idea that somehow, if you are faithful in practicing your religion and faithful to God, that you will have good things, health and wealth, and everything will be perfectly fine. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never in the gospel of Jesus Christ does he tell you that if you follow his rules, if you follow him, that life will be easy. In fact, just the opposite. If you're paying attention, if you follow Jesus, he will tell you that people will mock you, they will laugh at you, they will criticize you, society will ostracize you, and you will be looked down upon. And that's exactly what happens to Christians. But the love of God can take that and make something good come from that. Just because you don't have good health doesn't mean God doesn't love you. Just because you're not super rich doesn't mean God doesn't love you. God loves you because of who you are, not what you can do. His love for you is unconditional. That love can never be broken. Nothing you do can ever separate you from that love. So when they preach this gospel of health and wealth, it's just a false gospel. They sell it because it makes them feel good and it makes other people feel good. But Jesus, di Jesus didn't come to make people feel good. He came to them to tell them that we are meant to be one with God, one with each other. And that means lifting each other up. That means joining together as a family, as the family of God, the people of God, and lifting each other up. That's the message that Jesus wants to give us. So let us take from this gospel today the message that we are all in need of being lifted up, loved, and cared for, but we have to do it for each other. Let us join together to be one family in Jesus Christ. As we come to celebrate this Eucharist, receive that host, and be the body of Christ. And then go forth from this building to live that gospel, to reach out to those people who are not feeling well, who are down and out, and lift them up, knowing 
that you are doing the work that Jesus Christ has asked us to do.